National Taiwan University, and he he's going to talk about absence of horizon in black hole forma formation. Thank you. Uh, so normally at this point I should thank the organizers, but uh, I just thank the audience. Um, so I'm going to talk about black hole formation and try to convince you that there will never be the appearance of horizon. Um, it's based on a recent paper with this archive number, and uh, the main reference is the paper by Kawaii Matsuo and uh, Yoko Kura. Um, <clears throat> we're not the first to claim that there's no horizon during black hole formation. There are earlier similar um, claims. For example, in two-dimensional gravity, um, where you can solve many things explicitly. It was shown quite some time ago that um, if you consider the collapsing of um, energy, um, actually the whole, that reaction of Hopkins radiation would prevent um, the appearance of horizon. Although, of course, you would say that um, the, the conclusion in two dimension might not be extrapolated to four dimension. Also, um, people consider scalar field theory um, in the domain wall configuration, coupled to gravity, so that the domain wall would collapse. And also there it's shown that Hawking radiation would not um, give you horizon in the end. Although in this case, you can say that it has to do with the specific properties of the scalar field theory. More recently, people also studied the fluid dynamics um, as a model of the interior of a collapsing star and show that back reaction of Hawking radiation um, prevent the appearance of uh, horizon. Although in this case, you might say that it relies on the validity of the dynamics model, uh, model in the interior of the star. Um, on the other hand, there are also um, other proposals like the first ball proposal motivated by string theory, <coughs> in which it's um, claimed that um, the horizon is a coarse graining of some fuzzy geometric structure um, so that actually there's no horizon. And also um, there's a firewall uh, paradox saying that if you assume that the black hole uh, evaporates in a unitary fashion, and if you also assume the validity of semi-classical field theory manipulations, um, then um, you are going to predict um, the appearance of a uh, very high energy flux near the horizon. Um, actually, when you get that um, conclusion, what you should say is that um, this high energy flux would actually change the geometry near the horizon. So you can't really trust um, um, your claim of the horizon in the usual conventional story. So let's first review um, some basics about black hole and formation loss paradox. Um, it's well known that for a distant observer, um, for something to fall through the horizon, it would take infinite time from the viewpoint of the distant observer. Because um, when you're getting closer and closer to the horizon, it's getting harder and harder with the light to um, get away from the horizon to reach the eyes of a distant observer. If you take this argument a step further, you're also going to conclude that it takes infinite time for a distant observer to see the formation of a black hole horizon. Because as you have more and more matter collapsing, as the geometry gets closer and closer to um, Schwarzschild's solution with horizon, um, it would get harder and harder um, for additional uh, material uh, mass to fall into this region. Um, because the closer you are to having a horizon, the harder it will be for additional objects to get into that area for a distant observer. Um, <clears throat> on the other hand, from the viewpoint of the infalling observer, um, the infrared observer can pass through the horizon within finite proper time. Um, and after that, the infrared observer will have to reach the origin within finite time. 
So that tells you that um, if you throw some information into the horizon, um, whatever that object is, it would it, it would quickly um, flow away from the horizon. And if there is some ripples or traces of this object in the near horizon region, the, um, the ripples might dissipate away quickly so that um, the Hawking radiation originated from the horizon area would um, not be able to carry much of the information of the infolding object. And therefore, you have the information loss because the information carried by the infolding object would quickly move away from the horizon into the origin. And uh, the Hawking radiation is generated in the near horizon region where there is very little information about the infolding objects. Some people might say that um, there is some microscopic physics such that even though you have very small remaining ripples near the horizon, perhaps the Planck scale physics would allow you to um, transfer this information to the Hawking radiation. Uh, but in a review paper um, by Thorin, it's um, there's a theorem telling you that this is impossible. So, although typically people like to say there's no drama at horizon because everything passing through the horizon will have to leave the horizon, um, but that's actually inconsistent with the unitarity of black hole evaporation. So there must be at least a order one collection to the horizon, and that is also the um, origin of the firewall story. So um, the convention of assumptions about black hole formation and evaporation um, are the following. It's based on the fact that Hawking radiation is extremely small. It's, it's really very, very small for any astronomical black hole. If, if you spend your whole life tracking the mass of the astronomical black hole, you're not going to see any change in the mass of the black hole. It's so tiny. Um, so for any practical purposes, if you are going to conduct any experiment within your lifetime, it's natural to assume that you don't have to worry about talking radiation. You can just take the usual Schwarzschild metric for a static black hole, especially when you are uh, in the stage of black hole formation, when there's um, matter collapsing, you have energy coming into um, the coming towards the origin. Um, the Hawking radiation going out is comparatively, you know, negligible. So it's a traditional assumption that you can ignore Hawking radiation during black hole formation. Similarly, you also ignore Hawking radiation during. Um, the infalling of the, of the object coming into the horizon for the same reason. And therefore, you would still say that for an infalling observer, even though this is strictly speaking not a static black hole, but the evaporating black hole, you would say that um, the evaporation is so slow. So if you are infalling, you should be able to use the Schwarzschild metric to see that it only takes finite proper time for the involving observer to cross the horizon and uh, reach the origin. So um, as a result, this is a conventional Penrose diagram for the formation and evaporation of black hole. <coughs> it's actually, um, just a result of patching two Penrose diagrams together, you have this part. The lower part is usual Penrose diagram for a static black hole without Hawking radiation. And during this part, it's assumed that Hawking radiation is so small, so um, it doesn't change the Penrose diagram. And uh, this part, the upper right part, is um, just a Penrose diagram for a Minkowski space. So you just put these two diagrams together. And so um, the blue line represents a collapsing shell. So you think of having a collapsing 
Spine Crochet coming in from S infinity. And uh, when the radius of the shell gets smaller than um, the Schwarzschild -Schwar radius, which is two times the mass of the shell, the horizon appears, and then you would have uh, Hawking radiation. And from the viewpoint of a distant observer, um, what they will see is that, um, of course, they cannot see anything happening in this region. So what they will see is that um, when the infalling observer or the infalling matter, um, they would never cross the horizon because crossing to the other side is a region that you cannot see from here. So what they will see is that at a certain instant of time, um, as the infalling observer gets closer and closer to the horizon, it would reach the origin at the same time when the horizon appears of zero radius. And then after that, um, it's in close here, here. So that's the usual story. So in this story, although for a distant observer, nothing can cross the horizon, you still have a horizon. And uh, also, you have Hawking radiation. Um, a note I like to uh, mention now is that um, in this picture, you see that Hawking radiation appears before the horizon appears. If you are taking this as your time axis, this is the 45 degree light cone direction, which we will call uh, coordinate U. So in terms of U, Hawking radiation appears here. So it appears before the horizon appears. Because uh, <clears throat> when I discuss with people about this story, often they would tell me, if you don't have a horizon, then you don't have Hawking radiation. Um, so what do you mean by back reaction of Hawking radiation preventing the appearance of the horizon? But actually, even in the conventional story, there is Hawking radiation before the appearance of horizon. And also, there's a bunch of literature um, giving you detailed calculation, showing you how this happens. Um, and also, another comment is that for a distant observer, an infalling observer, represented by this gray line, um, hits the horizon at exactly the same point when the black hole forms namely when the horizon appears, and also completely evaporates. But this, I mentioned this, but, but I want to emphasize this point again because this is a little bit puzzling, right? So from the viewpoint of the uh, infalling observer, after passing the horizon, he, he's doomed, right? He's going to face the singularity or the Planck scale turbulent physics near the origin. But from the viewpoint of a distant observer, they would think everything is going to be okay, right? The infalling observer will never cross the horizon. On the other hand, the black hole will evaporate away. So there's no chance for the infalling observer to meet any uh, bad, bad things happening. Um, but according to the conventional wisdom, you see that bad things does happen, although from the viewpoint of this observer, he would see something happening in a discontinuous way. So at the same point, at the same time here, he sees that the infalling observer comes to here, and suddenly it, it's smashed into tiny pieces due to the singularity over here. So there's a discontinuity from this point to that point. Now, um, of course, um, you cannot say too much you know, if this is the correct story, so you see something that appears to be discontinuous, that's okay, that's possible in geometry. Um, but what really happens here is supposed to be a simple question which you can check according to general relativity. So what we're going to do next is just to use Einstein's equation and track the trajectory of the infalling matter and uh, to, to show you that actually the trajectory is not like uh, what's shown in this picture. Oops. So um, this was done in a 
uh, Mado by Hawaii Matsuo and Yoko Pula um, in their paper. I'm going to refer to this as the KMY model. In this model, they consider the spherical configuration. So you have a spherical shell collapsing. And to, to simplify everything so that you can calculate everything exactly, um, you consider a, they consider a collapsing shell of no matter, namely everything in here um, falls towards the origin at the speed of light. So this is the fastest, fastest possible collapsing of the star. If this kind of collapsing cannot give you horizon, you are likely to be convinced that nothing can give you horizon. Right? This is as fast the collapse can happen. So consider a cycle shell of finite thickness of mass m collapsing at speed of light. And also, um, in order to have the spherical symmetry, you also assume that Hawking radiation is spherical. And also, for simplicity, let's assume that we only consider the massless radiation of no dust. And the conclusion will be that there is no horizon according to Einstein equation. Um, so this configuration, um, the solution, Einstein's solution for this configuration, outside the spherical shell is uh, very easy to write down. Um, and if somebody else has done it for you, it's called the outgoing by the metric. It applies to the region outside the outer surface of the spherical shell. So let's call the outer surface of the spherical shell uh, to have the radius capital R. And the metric has a coordinate u corresponding to the coordinate u I um, drew earlier in the parallel diagram. It's a light cone coordinate. And I'm going to use it as the time coordinate. And you have spherical symmetry, so you have spherical coordinates and also radial coordinate r. So r is fixed by this term. Whatever appears here is called r squared. And normally, um, for a static black hole, you would have uh, this parameter A equal to 2 times the mass m. But because of Hawking radiation, um, the mass m will change with time. It should decrease in time. And so A should also decrease in time. So this, this metric um, is the unique solution of Einstein equation when you assume um, like-like outgoing radiation in the region outside the shell. For a static black hole, um, A would be a constant. And then you can um, do a coordinate transformation to put it in the usual Schwarzschild um, metric form, where you have time coordinate T and uh, the same radio coordinate R, although U and T uh, differs by a function of R, conventionally called R star, which is this function. So here I have A0, uh, meaning the case of um, static black hole when A is constant, called A0. A point to note here is that when R goes to A0, this is minus infinity. And therefore, U would have to be infinity. This tells you that um, this coordinate transformation is um, sort of singular if you try to apply it to an evaporating black hole, because when you have an evaporating black hole, A would um, reduce its value to zero. And after A goes to zero, you would go to the Minkowski space, in which you wouldn't have this factor or this kind of thing anymore. And also, you wouldn't have black hole. And therefore, um, if you are considering from the viewpoint of infalling observer, when you do this kind of coordinate transformation, you should worry about um, the validity of the notion of time scale when you compare the notion of time scale from the viewpoint of the involving observer to that of a uh, distant observer. Now this um, metric tells you that there are two um, classes of light-like curves. The first kind for a, a constant u, it, it, it's, um, you can think of those as the trajectory of Hawking radiation of the node dust. 
And also, um, the other, like my curve, if you consider um, the trajectory of the outer surface of the collapsing shell, consider a particle on the outer surface of collapsing shell, its trajectory is given by capital R of U. And since we assume that everything is coming down at the speed of light, this equation should determine the trajectory of the point on the outer surface. So we can um, divide this equation by du and find the first order differential equation for capital R, and then determine the trajectory of the outer surface of the collapsing shell. So now the question is, if you think the shell would collapse to form a horizon, there should be a point at which the value of capital R gets smaller than the value of little a, right? Little a is like the Schwarzschild radius at some time u. So in order for you to see the appearance of horizon or some trapping surface, what you need is for the trajectory of capital R to be smaller than a. And this is a simple question you can easily answer by finding solutions of that first order differential equation. So with different initial conditions of capital R, the horizontal axis is U, you can track its trajectory. And you can see that it never crosses A. Here I'm using the uh, conventional theory of Hawking radiation to give you the trajectory of A. So use the usual formula for Hawking temperature and then you can estimate the energy flux and how fast the star evaporates, and that tells you this curve of A. And then you can solve the trajectory of R. So in the beginning, when the shell is still far away, the center is almost empty. Of course, everything comes in at speed of light quickly towards the center. But as, there's, as, as there is more and more matter in the near the origin, the, um, geometry is changed such that um, it goes slower and slower. This is just what we said about the viewpoint of distant observer. But point to um, note is that when you're getting close to the point when the black hole nearly evaporates completely, we enlarge this region in this diagram Although um, these three curves are not the same three curves here, I chose a initial value um, here coinciding with the trajectory, trajectory of A to show you that even for some point over here, it would not be able to go inside the horizon. So namely, um, the trajectory of A goes so fast that even you are moving at speed of light, you cannot catch up with it. So when everything evaporates, um, you actually still have a finite size of the cyclical shell. And so um, the conventional story that everything goes to the origin at the same point when um, black hole forms and evaporates from the distant observer, that statement is not true. Right? We made a statement about what distant observers should see according to the conventional story, but this is not consistent with that. Um, what I'm going to show next is that um, this feature, this uh, feature that um, nothing can cross into the Schwarzschild radius, does not depend on the details of the theory. The only assumption we need to make is that a is decreasing with time. But first, let's summarize the K and Y model in a Penrose diagram. This is the Penrose diagram, the conventional theory, where you say that for a distant observer, it sees at the same point the appearance and collapsing of the black hole. But here, um, you see things falling in at the speed of light. With Hawking radiation, um, the horizon never forms. So you have the same Penrose diagram as in Kelsey's case. And therefore, of course, in this Penrose diagram, there, there's no um, paradox about information loss. OK, so um, I'm going to sketch a simple proof uh, by contradiction. 
So um, we think about the uh, spectral shell collapsing. Um, and uh, if there is going to be a horizon appearing, it means that at some point, the outer, the particles on the outer radius of the shell will have to cross the Schwarzschild radius A. So at some instant of time, the value of capital R will have to be equal to um, the value of A. So if there is really a horizon to appear, then there must exist a value of U at which R equals A. But this would be a contradiction because at this point, when A equals R, you can apply the outgoing Wagner metric to the trajectory of A, right? Strictly speaking, the outgoing Wagner metric only applies to the region larger than or equal to capital R. So when you have little a smaller than R, actually little a is not a real um, uh, point that you can realize in the metric. But if you assume that there is a horizon, then there would be an instant of time when R equals A. But you can check that the trajectory of A, the trajectory of A is always, according to the outgoing by the metric, um, like a uh, space lag. So it's always going faster than the speed of light according to the outgoing by the metric. So it's impossible for anything to, to you know, anything that goes at a speed of light or a lower speed to cross it. And so you have a contradiction because R, capital R, can never go faster than light. Okay. Um, a quick comment about firewall. Um, so uh, the firewall is essentially just tracing back Hawking radiation observed by distant observer back to the horizon of the black hole. And because of the blue shift, the blue shift can be as large as you like when you get to closer and closer to the horizon. Um, so you get a firewall near the horizon. Essentially, that's the idea. But um, here you can also calculate how much blue shift you get. Although here you have a cutoff because you have a collapsing shell and uh, the Hawking radiation appears um, on the shell. So you should not look into Hawking radiation inside the shell. Inside the shell, there's no Hawking radiation. And so the, the blue shift is cut off by the size of the shell. If we plug in um, the trajectory of R for um, in the KMY model, in which case you can uh, write down a, a approximate solution if you assumed a very small Hawking radiation so that A changes very slowly. You see that um, the cutoff is such that um, the energy density, the, en the, the energy flux density um, on the shell is actually very small if you have an astronomical size um, star collapsing. Okay, so to conclude, um, firstly, some people worried about observational evidence as a black hole. Observationally, of course, you still have black hole. You have, right, even in the traditional story from the viewpoint of a distant observer, you never see the formation of a horizon, but you can see black hole because black hole is just something that's very black. So you can have something very close to Schwarzschild radius, but still um, without horizon. Um, and in, in this um, arguments, we only use semi-classical large-scale large -scale physics. Um, we didn't rely on string theory or um, assumptions of um, exact physics. But um, in the end, we see that there's no firewall and no information loss. Thank you. Thank you very much. So questions, comments, and discussion. So, so, so what's happening from the viewpoint of the moving observer of the infrared show if you are floating a bit?